I've got an emotional question, actually. An emotional um, question. To follow yes. on from that, which is, um, how has your uh, quest for truth and reality shaped how you feel about life and mortality? Or should I be asking that question the other way around? Ah. And if I can append one sort of brief um, <laughs> bit to the end of that, which is, um, and to what extent do you think um, a search for a secular soul, collective or personal, motivates this Oh, question. dear, yes. I didn't want to be asked questions Easy like question. that. <laughs> um, I don't know. It does affect the way I think of it a bit, but I don't think... I, I don't have any views in the sense that I don't have any opinion as to what goes on. The only thing I would say is that I don't believe in minds floating around out there without anything to attach themselves to because I do think it's a function of some structures that are present in our heads and um, <clears throat> it's not a story which I've really talked about in this uh, series of, of uh, topics or in the book although there's a slight talk about it um, I certainly think that if there is some continuation of one's existence it's got to be in some other being of like us, not perhaps li exactly like us, somewhere else so that's a conceivable point of view. It makes more sense to me than, than just snuffing out completely. Maybe it's the emotional issue about having this incredibly boring universe that has nothing in it and, and nobody in it, and, and what's it doing there? <laughs> so uh, you could say, well, it's there waiting to become the next eon. And what's the point of that? Well, it does the, is there a point in asking what's the point of it? Well, I think there probably is, but I think we know so little about these things at the moment that um, any speculation that I might make here is certainly not founded in any um, theoretical or observational evidence. So let me leave it at that. Um, was there another uh, gentleman here? Yes. Well, thank you very much for your brilliant talk uh, um, about fundamental principles. I uh, wanted to ask you, uh, your world is entirely mathematical. The world of um, uh, the physics community is, is, is similar. We're going to have a theory, ultimately, which will work, presumably, and will be tested. It will be a highly mathematical object if we take mathematics as a whole, uh, then there's a Googleplex of possible theories. More than that, uh, yes. <laughs> yes. And um, I wondered, do you have any ideas about what might distinguish that piece of mathematics which represents reality from all of mathematics? Or to put it a different way, um, what is the nature of the existence of mathematics? What is the nature of...? Of, ma of mathematics as an existent yes. entity. Yes. Well, I, I didn't draw this picture, but I have pictures of the three worlds that I often depict where the world at the top represents the platonic world of mathematics, which somehow conjures itself into existence. <laughs> and then a little part of that, as related to your question, as far as we know, only a very tiny part of that has to do with the operation of the physical world. It is very mathematical, but if you... Well, you can open any pure mathematical journal and you see interesting questions discussed there. As far as we can see, nothing to do with the physical world. I mean, maybe it has, and maybe all these things have to do with the ma ma physical world, but we don't know it yet. But it does seem that there are certain very particular parts of that platonic world of mathematics which are responsible for the actions of the world we live in. And so I have a little bit of that world coming down, and there's the physical world. And then this comes in again, because you say, well, there's the third world, which is the world of, world, world of mentality. And only a very tiny part of the physical world seems to conjure up this mentality. And so the mental world is really a very tiny part of that world. And so there's the mental world, um, which is the world of our perceptions, our consciousness, 
our understandings and so on. And then a very, very tiny part of that has to do with mathematics. Most of it is concerned with all sorts of other things. And so there's a little bit of a paradox. It's each tiny part of each one has to do with the next one. So I only present this as a paradox without being a solution of the paradox. But your question had to do with what do I think. All I can give you is a biased view that I have of certain things which I have found to be fruitful. And I think there are certain areas of mathematics which seem to have much more in them than you put in. I mean, often, you know, you put in certain ideas, you put in certain actions or something, you get a certain amount out. But there are certain things where you put in an extraordinarily tiny amount, and there's an enormous world hiding under that. And the one that struck me the most was the world of complex numbers and complex analysis. When I was a, a student, an undergraduate at University College London, and I learned about complex analysis, I was absolutely stunned. It seemed to be a subject which had magic every place you turn. And that was a place you just, you take the, what are called the, well, the real numbers, the ordinary sort of numbers, which are along a line, which basically the Greeks, Eudoxus, understood, and uh, we've formalized a little more precisely later on. But uh, that's what was called the real numbers. But there's this hidden world of the complex numbers, the imaginary numbers. You just put in the square root of minus one, and you have that whole world free with just one little addition. That's the square root of minus one. And you get all your equations can be solved, not just x squared equals minus one. But it's, it's just magic. And the magic at every place. You find that uh, you don't have infinite number of different ways of having smoothness. You have just one way. You have also these, these things have a life of their own, which is magical. And I always thought that, you know, wouldn't it be wonderful if the world somehow, the physical world, was based on that kind of thing? And so that a lot of the kind of ways of exploring the way the physical world operates has been stimulated by that. We see for a long time, mathematics, mathematicians use these complex numbers as tricks. You could solve equations to do with electric circuits. You could solve airflow in two dimensions over aerofoils and so on. Oh, beautiful things. But along comes quantum mechanics, and suddenly you see these numbers are there, controlling the way the world operates at its tiniest level. And that, to me, was stunning. And it was trying to develop that idea into, well, twister theory, which Andrew knows about because he's <laughs> been working on this very fruitfully um, for an awful long time. And... Uh, that's, I suppose, the thing I would say more than anything I can think of. And there are many other things which you can see in mathematics have a tremendous... They sort of... I mean, Cantor's theory of infinite numbers. Some of that suggests that, you know, it must have a role to play in physics, but we see no particular role for it. You don't have to go any bigger than, as far as we know, the next number after the smallest number, the smallest infinite number. And... Um, you don't use any of that stuff. <laughs> so what is it? Well, there are a lot of other little ideas which are used. The fiber bundles, which I referred to, that's a nice idea. But I think the complex numbers, I would say, is the one that strikes me most. I shouldn't spend any more time because there might be other questions. There's time for them. Do have a question in the gallery? Okay, there's yeah. the gallery. As a simple engineer, um, when I grew up, I always um, realized that in a way, if I looked at mass and I looked at my engineering experiments, that infinity cannot exist. And so when I then studied mass and looked at a lot of the problems um, as an engineer, I found that these equations often had those problems. Now, when we look at the universe or at the physics in our world, the beauty is that the physics exists everywhere the same. So, I mean, what we see here exists everywhere in the universe. In that way, you could describe it as boring. Um, but isn't it rather that I think 2000, uh, like, yeah, I would say 2013 and 1915. So with the discovery of the Higgs particle, I think a lot of the um, mass which had developed over the years, um, I mean, there's a big disappointment or because these uh, supersymmetries 
they seem to not exist. Mm. So I think people have tramped themselves into like irrelevant, like I would not, I think something which does not exist. So, and so don't we have to rethink our world and like what you say is boring. You try <laughs> to make that point about the Big Bang, something we can't look into right now. Um, because well, that's the horizon. Can, we have the horizon mm. and we can't look beyond it. But the boring mm. stuff is that our physics have to exist there as well. And what we know is that infinity doesn't exist. So well. <laughs> some, somehow, um, I think the answer is here in our own world, in our own physics. And, and I think, I don't know, that's just like from a me mechanical engineering mind. Um, I'm somehow stuck there. Well, you'd be pretty stuck without infinity in mathematics. I mean, you could say... I mean, I know there are people who have suggested theories where there's the largest number. I mean, I've heard Robin Gandhi made suggestions. I mean, I don't think he believed it, but whether it makes a consistent system, that there might be a, la a largest number. Well, you see, numbers like 10 to the 10 to the 124, is, it, if there, is that larger than the largest number? Well, then you're in trouble, you see. So you have to talk about... You have to be able to talk about infinity in mathematics, or you're pretty stuck very early on. Now, is that physically real in some sense? Well, we don't know. I mean, maybe the universe is physically infinite. Maybe the eons go on indefinitely in both directions. I don't know. I don't want to rule it out to say, you know, infinity can't be there. I mean, okay, maybe it's not. Maybe these things are finite in one sense or another. But we don't know. And I see no reason to exclude infinity. I mean, We've got used to it in mathematics, and have to exclude it in mathematics would be a disaster. Uh, it's much easier to have infinity than to have a <laughs> stop somewhere in, in the numbers. You're really in trouble then. So, uh, but is physical, the world, is finity, infinity there in the physical world in some sense? Well, we don't know. Um, is there something outside our horizon? Well, if the scheme I was referring to at the end, yes, there is, because you can see outside the horizon in the previous eon, and therefore you can... In fact, the claim is that some of the signals that we can see in the cosmic microwave background, the claim I'm making, if the scheme is right, is actually indicating events that are technically what would have been known as outside our particle horizon. So these ideas can be temporary. And in this picture, that particular idea is temporary. That is to say, a particle horizon does not re represent the limit of what we can see in cosmology. So we don't know. So it's nice to think about these things. And is the universe behaving the same way here as it is way, way, way over there? We still don't know. But it does seem that the laws, that's the way we work in physics. We, put, we try to assume that the laws behaving in very distant regions are the same as they are here. But the, the circumstances may be different, so the, temp the ambient temperature is different and so on. So they're the same basic laws, but in detail they may be a bit different. So I'm not sure that's an answer to your question. In fact, I'm not even sure what the question was. But <laughs> I, I, think, I think at this point there's, there could be an infinite number of questions, yes, but I think, I think so. it's a finite time that Roger can be expected to stand on his feet and answer them, and it's time to, to, uh, to move on. I'll say two things. First of all, if you read Roger's book, you'll find that he, reading his page is to hear his voice. And with all the, I mean, he writes as he speaks. And I, I encourage you, if you're stimulated by what he's said, to find out much more um, uh, from, from reading his work. Uh, and uh, I think there'll be opp opportunity to, uh, for a book um, sale afterwards. And the other thing is that there's a very exciting new development which uh, an announcement, which I'm going to pass over to Mr. James Tagg to, uh, to make. <coughs> Hi, yes. So I'm, I'm a, an engineer and a physicist, kind of, and a long-standing fan of uh, Roger's work. And in the last few years, it's been become evident to a number of us that you could uh, test experimentally a number of Roger's ideas. And I think whether you find that they are exactly right or exactly wrong, <laughs> sorry, um, you'll find uh, enormous practical benefit and maybe uncover some really interesting truths. And so what we're doing is we're founding a Penrose Institute 
to look at some of his work. And so we're going to look at three things. And obviously, the, the, the thing you learn uh, if you work with Roger is that you shouldn't use words. So let's use some pictures. So the first thing we're looking at is these uh, issues of artificial intelligence. This is Sophia, a robot. You can watch me talk to her uh, on the internet. I'll post it in the next day or so. Um, and the question is whether humans, or human intelligence and artificial intelligence is the same. And you may see that we put a, a, a kind of cheeky chess puzzle in the Telegraph this morning. And actually, it has a serious purpose. And what we're trying to do is pose questions to humans that we think machines would find very difficult to do. And therefore, we want to uncover humans that are very good at these sort of creative, particularly things that we think are non-computable. And then we're actually going to scan your brains uh, in a non-destructive way um, and see if we can find out where the seat of creativity, what process is going on. The, the next thing that we're looking at is one of the criticisms of Roger's original work in The Emperor's New Mind was that uh, no one could imagine that quantum effects could occur in biology, sort of at you know, room temperature in, in, in our brains. And so what recently happened is that uh, photosynthesis was found to be one of these exotic quantum effects. So at, at room temperature or plant temperature, whatever you want to call it, uh, um, energy is transported through the, the plant to the reaction center uh, with, with, with greater efficiency than it would be explained by just a resistor. And so we now know that it's not completely daft to imagine that there could be some sort of exotic quantum effect going on in the brain. And the other interesting thing is that we can actually now measure it. So, yes. So it's now become possible to put these tiny little nanoprobes into bundles of nerve cells or neurons and watch and see whether they're doing quantum things, measure their resistance. And interestingly, with Stuart, who is an anesthetist, an anesthesiologist, um, you can actually put these bundles to sleep. So you can see whether when you turn consciousness off and then hopefully back on again when we go under um, <laughs> anesthetic, um, wh whether it has some effect on these, these, these sort of strange things that we think they're quantum. And then the final thing is, is that... Uh, it's now possible to build, uh, I, I, I can't say quantum gravity sensors because it's wrong, sensors which are sensitive to quantum mechanics and relativity. And it's possible to build some of these very small sensors. These are Bose-Einstein condensate sensors um, that can detect gravity waves. And so there are some practical applications of this. So you could build one of these. They're desktop size. You build one of these and move it around and see... Uh, sort of gravitational deformations in the Earth, you know, massive pieces and less massive pieces, and maybe find oil or maybe detect that there's a, um, a volcanic f um, sort of activity that's going on, or point them out into space and turn them into a telescope and make a telescope uh, in the gravitational sort of spectrum. You know, we have four forces, and at the moment we only ever image the sky with electromagnetism, it would be possible to image it with gravity. And that produces all sorts of interesting uh, things. And the other thing, of course, is that once you've got a sensor that's highly sensitive to quantum mechanics and relativity effects, then maybe you can sort of tease out and, and find some new experiments to test Roger's idea about spontaneous collapse uh, of the wave function and this, this sort of marrying of quantum mechanics and gravity.